Well, hey everyone, good afternoon or good morning to you. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, my name is Barton Sieber. I'm a chef, author, seafood evangelist, proud father, and proud Maine resident here on the ragged, delicious coast. Uh, as any of you who have joined us before know, uh, I like to start off by saying something that I appreciate um, and am thankful for these days because, well, we live in difficult times for sure. And uh, it's always a good thing just to acknowledge the beauty and the joy and the camaraderie and the love around us. And today uh, I woke up, as with other days, uh, appreciating a truly unique experience, which is a freshening tide uh, with all of its redolent smells of shellfish and seaweed and just all things lovely and wonderful about summer. And mixed with that is the fact that my acre plus of land here on the coast is completely surrounded by a bevy of lilac bushes than trees that have, have bloomed. You can see some of them over here. And uh, wow, the smell of a freshening tide carrying the scent of lilacs is a truly, uh, well, just profound experience. And for that, I'm, I'm very thankful today. And I hope that you had something you were thankful for. I'm thankful also for you joining me. So last week, we skipped our week. And by skipped, I mean we chose to go silent in uh, support of and in recognition of the events and protests happening here in the United States and the world around uh, for Black Lives Matter. And though this week we are returning to regularly scheduled programming, uh, please know that we are doing so with our eye and our hearts still towards those who protest that which is unjust in this world. So, uh, as I say, regularly scheduled programming, we do so with the acknowledgement that regular for so many people is simply not good enough. Um, and that we will continue to stand in support of and to express our love for all of those who, uh, well, need our help and need to live in a world that better acknowledges them and that their lives matter. We love you. We support you. So with that, um, let's dive into crabs. So we're continuing on with shellfish month and crabs. Well, this is a really good one. And uh, I've got uh, a couple of friends who've sent me some great products. Our friend uh, John Rohrpaw down at Profish DC. Check them out. They've sent me some wonderful Chesapeake crab, the flavor of my youth. Uh, we've got a number of products from Alaska that we're going to be talking about. And, well, some really fun dishes. So to start off with, hey, let's talk crab species. What we've got. Actually, you know what? One thing before that. So I live on the coast of Maine. As I said, I've got some great friends here. And among them is a gentleman by the name of Marsden Brewer. Uh, who is a visionary fisherman and farmer uh, who now farms scallops. So before we dive into crabs, let me just show you something really cool because, well, I was on a conference call and Marsden just sauntered into my backyard with a cooler the other day and delivered me three different bags of live scallops, which are something that you have very likely never seen. So these are farmed. Uh, he is from Penn Bay Farmed Scallops.com. Penn Bay Farmed Scallops, P E N B A Y, as in Penobscot Bay. Uh, fellow Mainer. But hey, check this out. And I'm going to uh, switch over my screen here. I'm not, my wife is yet to join me. We're still putting the, uh, the kid squid down for a nap up there. But um, this is a whole scallop. And this is live. So what you see in there. Uh, are a whole set of little eyes, all of these little dots that surround it here on what's called the mantle. How cool is that? Scallops can actually see and, well, they can't see much, but they can sense movement and light and shadow. And, well, then they open and close their shells like a jet propulsion system and scoot around the ocean bottom. And they're just really cool uh, animals. But it's very, very rare to see a whole scallop or a live scallop because, well, we don't eat the whole of it. And there's good reason for that. Partially, mostly because, well, uh, they can carry toxins within the rest of the organs, uh, wild scallops can, that, uh, well, we need to avoid. And so thus we just eat the adductor muscle. And you've seen this muscle in scallops and clams and mussels and oysters, it's the muscle that opens and closes the shell that's attached on the bottom and on the top. 
So when you shuck a scallop, you have the mantle on the top, but then underneath as well, you've got a little bit of a row sack right there, which is absolutely delicious, filled with this butter brine, sea beauty, Aphrodite charm. Oh my God, it's so good. And to cook them all together, well, is to sustainably enjoy the entire animal when it's sourced from a farm that can guarantee the water quality and thus the safety as the Penn Bay farm scallops can. So in order to prepare them, you just snip off this belly section right here, which is the only part of it which is perfectly edible, really, but not all that desirable. Um, and then you have the, the foot here, or the siphon, which is how the scallops filter, the, suck in the water around them in order to filter it for food. So they come in all sorts of different sizes. Look at, look at how cute these little guys are. Look at that. That's a whole little scallop. How much fun is that? right? So uh, we've cooked these up the other night. Um, I shucked them off. I shucked then the bottom shell as well, snipped off that little uh, belly, and then doused them in a garlic parsley butter and threw them under the broiler in, of course, my favorite, my favorite piece of equipment, the toaster oven, because why not? Anyway, uh, I know that we're focused on crabs today, but Hey, my life is so awesome that I just get random deliveries of delicious seafood that is super rare and awesome. And, well, I wanted to share that with you. And please uh, make effort to maybe share it with yourself by going to PennBayFarmedScallops.com. Okay. And there, my lovely wife has now joined us. Welcome, Carrie. Thanks. All right. So the kid, the kid squid is now down for a nap. We have gotten all the way through scallops. Um, and now we're going to dive into crab species here. So thanks for joining me. So the first and foremost, the, uh, there are three, well, there are four uh, species of crab that we'll really talk about today. The first is blue crab. Now, blue crab is the crab of the East Coast, the Chesapeake, rain, really Long Island Sound, uh, all the way down through the Gulf, throughout Texas, um, Mexico, Central America, down into Venezuela. Uh, where a lot of crab comes from. And it's all the same species. It's a blue swimming crab, and therefore the back legs are little swimmerettes. They're sculling legs. They look like paddles. And these little diamond-shaped, beautiful crabs with their cerulean blue sort of sage green blend of shell color, they propel themselves through the water really at, at pretty incredible speed. Um, and they're, they're known as beautiful swimmers, which they really are. Uh, but all crabs, well, they're, uh, they also share uh, a Latin name with uh, the world's most deadly disease, which is cancer. And that does tell you a little bit about the personality of crabs. They're ra rather bellicose little dudes, uh, not very friendly, and uh, apt to fight you for just about anything. But they're also delicious. So I spent my youth, uh, I was very fortunate to spend some of it down on the Chesapeake Bay, a tributary of the Patuxent River, it's called. And I spent my days in the quest for food there, and a lot of that was pulling giant blue crabs off the pilings on docks or wading through the eelgrass to find uh, blue crabs that were molting or shedding their shells so that they could grow larger. In that process, they become soft shell crabs, uh, which is the delicacy we won't really dive into today, but I'm happy to take some questions on. So for blue crab, uh, sure, there is the blue crab feast. Is that the street sweeper that started up outside? Yeah, In the sure middle is. of the rain? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> anyway, leave it to live TV to invite the street sweeper to your neighborhood. Um, blue crab, of course, is eaten in the blue crab feast or the crab boil uh, in which they're actually steamed. Uh, and, well, blue crab has a yield of about 13% from whole crab down to meat. So it's a lot of work. It's rather punitive to your fingers, uh, but delicious. It usually involves a lot of beer and a lot of this old friend of mine, Old Bay. Yep, that's the flavor of my youth right there. Oh, man. Anything with Old Bay on it is just like redolent of sunshine and youth and opportunity and delicious. Yeah, it's a good smell to me. Anyway, uh, blue crab is most typically sold as meat, uh, pre-cooked pre and then shucked from uh, the shells, and which is a very labor-intensive process. 
And you have multiple uh, qualities of meat or sizes, really, because all crab meat is delicious. So it's sold both fresh form, as I've got in front of me here today, as well as pasteurized and canned and frozen. All of it quite good, depending on the use that you're intending it for. So what I've got in front of me today is the, well, it's the highest echelon of the crab meat, uh, and that is what's called jumbo lump. And these are the, the largest single pieces of crab. They're a single muscle that comes from just the back beneath the last swimmerette, the last little flipper. Uh, and this just gives you those wonderful big chunks of, of juicy, sweet, aromatic meat. Now, they always come uh, really sold by the pound. So you'll see them in these little pint containers like this. In order to assess the quality of crab, what you want to see is a general fairly dry, but still with a sheen of moisture to them. Uh, and you want to check for consistency of size. So, of course, on the top layer there, you're going to get the best looking pieces because, well, you know, when you pull that off, you want to be impressed. So the best way to check the quality of what you're buying, flip it over onto the top. And what you're going to see in there is, well, you should still see nice big chunks of delicious crab. You should see a, a reasonable amount of moisture. And if you see little bits of orange in there like that or little strands of yellow running through, that's a good thing because that's crab roe. That's also the mustard, it's called, uh, one of the internal organs that's spicy, peppery in its flavor and adds so much contrast to the sweetness of the crab. So this right here, that is a perfect pint of crab meat. And uh, again, uh, I want to thank my friends down at ProFish DC uh, for sending this along, my great friend John Rohrpaw. Uh, they do home delivery in the D.C. area, so please check them out. They're a great source uh, for this and other great seafood products. I believe they also do some online ordering as well, but you might have to call in for that. But anyway, thanks to John for this. So that's blue crab. And again, that has a significant cultural history throughout, well, Long Island Sound, as I said, all the way down through the Gulf, and especially down to New Orleans and the great cuisines of the South, um, I've been watching a, a friend of mine, Jim Gosson, uh, the Gulf, Louisiana, the Gulf Seafood Institute, who's been posting a lot of pictures of these big, giant, soft-shell crab sandwiches, deep-fried, the tomatoes on a potato bun. Woo! Man. Let me tell you, the South knows what it's doing with seafood and with crab. Uh, yeah, very much so. So other species that we've got, and I, I got to thank my friends up in uh, Alaska, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. They sent me a bunch of crab. and uh, So what we've got in front of us is also king crab. So a couple of different species of king crab, red, golden, blue, uh, that are all sold under the same name as king crab. And, well, these are the largest crabs that you're going to find. Giant, giant leg spans, as you can see. Big, giant claws. Uh, these are... These are pretty nasty creatures, man. I would not want to run into one of these unless it was cooked in, in a nice salty brine and then frozen and shipped down to me, which, yeah, thank you very much for. So this is a really true luxury ingredient, and it comes from waters far away from us. If you've ever seen The Deadliest Catch on Discovery Channel, well, this is why people risk their lives for this, because it's so valued and, well, so delicious. So... I'll show you a little bit about how to cut into that uh, and how to use that. We're going to be doing some warm dishes for crab today. And then I've got two other species. These are some clusters and claws from Opilio or snow crab. Uh, slightly smaller than the king crab, but has that same sweet, unctuous deliciousness, that wonderful briny aroma. And then uh, the great and famous crab of the West Coast, the Dungeness crab. Now this is a uh, a cluster, it's called, as, as is this. Uh, and this is half of the Dungeness crab with its carapace or shell removed. And then that's also been cooked and then frozen. So this is ready to eat. The legs, uh, the, the really tough shells have already been pounded with a, a mallet to crack them. So that's what we've got. Uh, those species, there's also the stone crab, of, uh, mostly in Florida waters. That's a delicious uh, sort of appetizer crab or cocktail crab. Um, yeah, so with that, I'd love to take a bunch of questions. I'm going to shift back over, and I'd first like to start up two dishes that are a little bit different. So we'll be teaching you about a crab cake, which is, well, you know, a really standard way to eat crab. But in addition to just 
simmering this and we're steaming these in water to you know, uh, slightly scented with lemon and salt, whatever, to heat them through and then just dip them in butter, which is absolutely fantastic. There are also some really fun ways to go about cooking these. And I'm just going to get a couple of things going here. I'm going to turn back to my trusty broiler, of course, as I do every episode of this. And the first thing I'm going to do is something, well, we're having a nice rainy day here in Maine. I was going to grill these outside uh, because when cooking crab in its shell, that shell, especially when exposed to high heat, wow, it chars, it singes, and it smokes, and it flavors the meat with this incredibly rustic, beautiful scent. So I'm going to you just use the trusty broiler and see what happens. I've never actually done this in broiler before. But um, yeah, so just a little bit of oil, and then I've got a crab claw, and then just a leg section. Okay. Quite awesome, I'm just gonna throw that in there and we're gonna see what happens. So here we go with that. So the other thing that I'm gonna be showing you is a dish uh, roasted crabs. And for this, I'm going to use, uh, I'm gonna throw in there both some Dungeness as well as some of the snow crab. And uh, what I've got here, is, uh, and Carrie, if you wouldn't mind, I think we might be close to the point where we're coming up on demo instructions. So I've got a bowl here. I've got some um, uh, previously boiled potatoes, some red pepper, some red onion. And into that, I am going to throw a mixture. I've got some green onion. I've got some uh, uh, microplant garlic. I've got a bunch of diced shallot in there and a bunch of parsley. Uh, and lemongrass and quite honestly I just reached into the fridge and kind of grabbed everything aromatic that I could find um, you could add capers to this you could add ginger to this lemongrass really whatever you've got this is a recipe that I first developed for Coastal Living magazine a while back and uh, I did versions of it that were sort of a Mediterranean with rosemary and capers uh, or an Asian version with a little soy sauce, ginger, garlic, scallion, and a little bit of ajimirin, a sweet rice cooking wine. So I've got a, uh, a cast iron pan heating up. And I've got a bunch of butter heating up as well because oh, crab and butter, yeah, it's delicious. I'm going to add uh, both oil and butter to this. And the whole thing is that we're about to make a really, really delicious, integrated, really messy, wonderful dish that's great for entertaining. It's so easy, it can be done ahead of time and then everything just tossed in. So I've got some additional clusters, some claws, and again, I'm gonna put that Dungeness meat in there. I'm gonna pull off one claw so I can demo that. And then one stick of melted butter, And then one of those activities, and I always hope goes well. It's usually uniform vegetables, not legs hanging out. What's that? It's usually uniform vegetables, not legs hanging yeah. out of a bowl. Yeah, that's a little tough. <laughs> anyway, I've got this uh, just beginning to smoke. It gets smoking hot over here. I'm going to turn the fan on for a minute. So you just keep that right on the, uh, and then I'm going to throw that into a super hot oven. With the broiler on max. I'll turn that off. I wasn't sure. A couple times ago we set off the smoke alarm. I try not to do that anymore. So. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie had to go sprinting off for that one. Anyway, so back on over this way. So I put in just, I, I overestimated what would fit on that pan. Um, but you want to have it so that the vegetables are in contact really with the pan itself. So that they roast uh, the crab, kind of sits on top and everything is covered with that delicious herb, spice, whatever, and butter mixture, whatever you wanted to throw in there. So under the broiler, 
it's going to cook down really quick, and those shells are going to char. The herb paste is going to singe and blacken and burn and add so much flavor. And th the whole thing of this is, well, you serve it right on that right on that pan, and everybody just kind of digs in with a fork of their hands. It is messy. It does require a whole roll of paper towels, and it requires you to take your copy of Miss Manners and put it over there, okay? Because, well, it's just messy, and that's the way it is, but I actually uh, developed that dish with Dungeness Crab as a holiday dish, you know, for entertaining on the coast in the... Uh, in the holiday season, uh, when the Dungeons Crab Fishery really kicks off in December and January. Anyway, uh, you can use frozen crab. Actually, I prefer to use frozen crab. It's a lot easier. Um, so those frozen crab clusters that I just thawed out on the counter or overnight in the fridge, easy done. You want to drain off as much of the liquid as you can. As you can see, there might be just a little left in the pan. You don't really want to use that. So anyway, uh, let me just check on... Oh, yeah. Hey, it's working. Cool stuff. Man, I love it when it works. Isn't that fun? I prefer it that way. You should prefer it that way. All right. So let's take a question here, and then I'm going to make some uh, crab cakes for you and then talk about that. So first from Sandra P. Wow. Okay. I picked up some local prawns. Head on. Nice. Good for you. Frozen from the local organic vegetable truck in Tulum, Mexico. There you go. So those must in Tulum, let's see, those would probably be brown shrimp or blue shrimp. I thawed and rinsed the prawns before grilling, and the water was filthy. I removed the heads and rinsed again, and the water was black. Okay, so the reason for that, Sandra, uh, is that the it's the material, it's the organs inside of the head. Uh, shrimp go bad very, very quickly. Uh, and that's why they're frozen. And uh, typically frozen is to preserve that shelf life. So the juices that are inside that head can go black very quickly. And that is not a bad thing. It, it just happens naturally. Uh, if it has any off aroma to it, other than maybe an intense iodine flip smell, uh, then you should worry about it. But really, that, that liquid that they are frozen in or encased in typically does get a little off-colored, and that's okay. Um, so don't be surprised by that. Uh, but really, smell is going to be your, your number one indicator of quality on that. So, hey, Sandra, thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Nice to see your name pop up. All right, another one from Wanda. What's the best way to preserve fresh crab meat in your refrigerator? And which cooking methods and sauces complement and bring out the natural flavors best? Well, thanks, Wanda. I appreciate your question. Um, so the best way to preserve crab meat is, well, uh, buy it as close to the time when you're going to use it. Uh, if you have frozen crab meat, only pull it out within hours before you need it. Uh, if you do buy it ahead of time, make sure that it is in the coldest part of your refrigerator, if not uh, sunk into a bowl of, of ice water slurry, something to just make sure it stays as cold as possible. If your refrigerator is 40, set to 40 degrees and you open and close the doors a lot, you certainly don't want to have it in the door section. You'd like best to have it in a drawer where it's going to uh, hold that temperature as best not be exposed to those fluctuations. But really, temperature is key there. And in terms of what flavors best flatter and highlight crab meat, well, crab meat is sort of noted for its sweetness, much the same in the way lobster is uh, and shrimp are. And therefore, this guy, lemon. Lemon is a crab's best friend. It just and lime, uh, but acid uh, just does wonders for crab meat. And in fact, uh, to me, it's sort of without acid, crab meat really isn't at its apex. Uh, excuse me, one second. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 man. It smells good. Watch this. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that. Might be premature. Watch me now burn it down. But um, yeah, that smells really good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Wanda, back to your question, really acid is the key there. Um, big flavors, uh, unless you're doing something like this roasted dish, uh, rosemary, garlic, those big flavors, uh, I tend to shy away from heavy flavor or big angular flavors with crab. Um, just, it can overpower it. And the beauty of crab is in its nuance and that sweetness to it. Uh, about as high as I'll go in terms of the flavor intensity scale 
as a pair with crab would be mustard. But whole grain mustard, ooh, man, so good. In fact, the first restaurant that I worked in under a chef named David Scribner, uh, who was really a formational person in my life and, and a great friend, uh, we did a dish, this crab cake that I'm about to show you, a, a modified version of. Uh, and he served it with sour cream mixed with whole grain mustard and lemon juice, a cool room temperature sauce. Oh, my Lord. That was so, so, so good. So those are some great flavors to pair. Tarragon also goes really well. It's just one of those things that just matches perfectly. So cool. Well, thanks for those questions, Juana and uh, Sandra. I'm gonna, just going to check on this again because, as I said, I've never done it before. So... Yeah, it's mostly working. I'm just going to put it back on high. Um, so, crab cakes. The key to crab cake is texture to me. Uh, well, first you start off with great quality crab meat, as I have. Um, and what I've done is I've picked through uh, the one pound of jumbo lump here. And I've got it in a bowl. And by picking through, meaning I'm just going and looking for any little bits of cartilage or shell that might be in there, uh, anything that's undesirable, because well, it's a very labor-intensive process and a very complicated construction of these little animals. So you really do need to pick through, but quality product from a great picker. This is coming from J.M. Clayton, uh, one of the, the legendary picking houses down on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake. Um, they do a really great job and they've got product that just, well, it doesn't require a lot of work once it gets to you. So when I look at crab cakes uh, and I provided you a recipe, I see there's a, there's a, some event documents there and references that you can click to download just beneath the screen there. Um, there's a recipe for a crab cake, but one of the things that I stress on that is that any liquid that is coming in the crab, well, that liquid tastes like just ocean gold. It's amazing and it's awesome and you don't want to waste that by any means. So the amount of breadcrumb that you're going to need to use is going to depend on that moisture, which is going to vary slightly, not so much, but it's not a hard and fast measurement. But the key to a great crab cake is, as my dad says, and I think he picked this up from a restaurant he frequented, uh, all killer, no filler. Killer being crab, filler being uh, the breadcrumb. So what I like to do is if that crab is very moist, uh, then I will mix it with lemon juice and the panko breadcrumbs first. Now, I really prefer using brioche breadcrumbs, but I couldn't find any, and I, I don't have the time or patience to make any right now. Um, so the panko breadcrumbs will suffice, and it's really, for me, more of an eyeball thing. Uh, however, just a few tablespoons is really enough. And the reason why I do this first is that I want that panko to absorb all of that crab juice, all that incredible flavor. And I'll also jumpstart the process by putting the lemon in as well at this point. And I'll do a full lemon. You want to just make sure you don't get any seeds in there, those little pops of bitterness that you don't want to. Ain't going to kill you, but ain't going to taste good either. So there's that. And then the key, take out that one last little lemon seed. Oh, well, I lost a lemon seed in there. Sorry, honey. <laughs> it's not the worst thing. <laughs> so I will stir that very gently because, well, one of the other keys to, uh, well, as I said, uh, the key to a great crab cake is texture. And what you don't want to do is spend $30 a pound for jumbo on crab meat and then mash it all up to the point where you can't even recognize what it was. Excuse me a second. I'm going to check on it. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait till I pull that one out. That, that dish is so good. So back to the crab cake. Mix it up very gently so that you're not flaking apart those big jumbo lumps. Now, I had mentioned earlier that the jumbo lump is the largest of them, but there's also many other categories of meat. There's back fin, which is a slight, there's lump, jumbo lump, lump, back fin, claw, special, and paste. 
and these are all meat that come from different parts of the animal, uh, have different textures, have different flavors even. The claw has a slightly gamey flavor, whereas the paste, which is, well, it's really used for bisques and flavoring stocks. It's, it's very heavily flavored. Um, you wouldn't make crab cakes out of that, certainly. Uh, so all of those different sort of sizes of meat all have their different culinary qualities to them. Uh, all are delicious in a crab cake, but jumbo lump really is the very best. And if you're making a whole lot of crab cakes, you might want to try a, a, a bit, you know, mixing back thin or special with some jumbo lump. Uh, and in that case, you'll just have these sort of punctuations of these big, beautiful chunks. So I've stirred that up just enough to get the sort of process going of the uh, panko absorbing the lemon juice and the crab juice there. Grab a spoon and then mayonnaise. Now I'm about to start a fight here. You ready? I like Duke's mayonnaise. Duke's is the best. There, I said it. You might be a Hellman's person. Somehow I ended up with some Cane's mayonnaise, which I've never had before. It's perfectly fine, but I, I have no idea where it came from. Um, anyway, mayonnaise amongst chefs is one of those things that can literally get down to like fisticuffs. Like you, you can start some battles when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to mayonnaise. Duke's is my preferred. So. Lots of Old Bay, not so much that it tastes like an Old Bay cake, but Old Bay, uh, a seasoning mix invented in 1939, and George Brown, I believe, uh, as I wrote about in my book, American Seafood. It's just become the flavor of the Chesapeake Bay of cooking with crab meat, uh, and it really accentuates the flavor of crab, drawing out those that sweetness and that saltiness, the brininess. Um, so this is really what you're looking for as the, the texture of the mixture. You should still see those. I'm just going to leave my wedding ring on. I usually take it off. It's, I, it's a I little appreciate too late. it. <laughs> so it should be crumbling and falling apart. It shouldn't be like compacted soil here or anything like that. And you just want to form it just enough so that it takes shape. Now, I'm a big fan of a big, thick mound of crab meat as the crab cake. And there's a couple of ways to cook this. Uh, at this point, I would leave them sit for maybe half an hour to an hour in the refrigerator. And what that allows for is the panko to continue to absorb and really bind this. You'll notice I didn't put any egg or anything in there, other traditional binders uh, that you'll often see in crab cake recipes. Sure, they're plenty great and, I mean, can be ethereal in their quality with an egg mixed in. It's just not how I do it. Uh, and then I just put them in a cast, or in, sorry, in a nonstick pan, lots of butter, and just let them sit on medium heat. And while they get crisp through, uh, well, as they get crisp on one side and they brown, flip them over and then throw the whole pan in, in the broiler to finish. So I'm just gonna wash up my hands here quick and we're gonna pull out the crab dishes that I've got going. And Carrie, I'm gonna ask you to, to maybe follow me over to the oven because I feel a great victory coming on that I'm gonna be very proud of here. Am I giving myself too much credit? We don't know yet. We don't. You know for sure, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, look at that silliness. Oh, my God. Gosh, sorry for those of you. Look at that. Oh, my word. That's steaming. That's steaming. It is, it, is, it is doing everything good. That is just as sexy of a dish as there ever was. Check that out. And the smell. Oh, my Lord. So I've got the potatoes in there. You can see those browned up a little bit. On the outside, those shells have charred just a little bit, perfuming the meat inside with all of their flavor. The red peppers, the onions have charred and softened a little bit. And Man, that's just... I'm, I'm very proud of that. You should be. Okay, cool. So I'm going to move that to the back over here because my wife is going to dive into that. 
with the glee, I think, when we're done here. And again, that's a mixture of opelio, uh, or snow crab, with dungeness crab. And uh, one of the things about uh, crab is that because it molts constantly, uh, crab typically molts almost two dozen times in their life, the crabs are not always beautiful, the crab legs. You might see some off coloration, little brown bits or black. You might see some barnacles on them or off coloration. It's totally fine. It's all just, they call them ugly crabs. Uh, I've just really learned about this. The second crabs even, uh, they're considered a, a lesser quality, but it's really just a lesser visual. And, and once you cook it up like that, I mean, not much is going to turn me off to that. So uh, much like produce, you know, the, the recent uh, move towards ugly fruit or ugly vegetables, meaning just things with a blemish that are otherwise delicious, don't throw them out. And if you're making dishes like this, look for them because the quality of the meat inside is just as good. And uh, you can often find them maybe at a better price. But from a sustainability standpoint, we should be eating them. Because, well, if we put the effort in to catch them and, well, take the animal from its environment and kill it, we need to respect it by eating it, right? So, there's that dish. We've gone through the crab cake as well. I'm going to just take a look at this. And, uh, again, a bit of an experiment there. I'm just going to keep going on the experiment. So, I'm going to take another couple questions, and then I'm going to show you one last dish, which is uh, a cool dish or a room temperature dish and how to clean the meat on one of these. So let's dive in another couple questions from Star P. Star, nice to see your name pop up again. Thanks for joining. For the crab cakes, is your preference for brioche breadcrumbs a texture thing or just flavor? Well, uh, good question. Thank you, Star. Uh, both. Brioche crumbs, uh, they absorb moisture quicker uh, than panko or any other breadcrumb that I've found. Uh, and sort of disappear more just due to the the fine grain texture of uh, of the brioche um, or hala bread uh, as it's is also known uh, plus the flavor it's a butter or milk based bread and so it's going to have some dairy richness to it it's going to have some sweetness to it that sort of accentuates and, and augments the flavor that's the only reason those are the reasons why uh, but I mean, any any breadcrumb just off the shelf is going to be great. I would just urge you not to look for something that's not seasoned breadcrumb. Uh, I accidentally picked some seasoned breadcrumbs up the other day, seasoned panko, and it's got pecorino romano and dried herbs in it, and it's delicious. It's just not exactly always what I want my dish to taste like. So uh, in that way, it's just you know, the addition of ingredients I don't necessarily want. So, hey, Star, thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Too. From Jacqueline O., a great name. What's the best way to cook soft shell crabs? I personally think less is more. You're right. No almonds. Almost no nothing. They are just so good as they are. Agree? I, I, indeed, I do. Uh, I think that um, soft shell crabs are, well, I mean, they're such a seasonal, wonderful delight uh, and are available really from May through September only uh, from Chesapeake down through the Gulf. Uh, yeah, I do just a, a, uh, a little bit of Old Bay and a little bit of Wondra flour or just regular flour. And that, that's simple. And I just cook them in a little bit of brown butter. I don't think you need to add almonds or anything, but lemon juice is certainly key. You know, it's not a flavor that adds its own flavor so much, ingredient that adds its own flavor so much as it just augments the flavors that are already there. Uh, but, you know, one of the dishes that I had once, my dad and I, uh, we're out eating at a restaurant called the Straits of Malaya, uh, a restaurant down off DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And they had a dish there called chili crabs, a Malaysian dish from what I understand. And it was it cooked almost like a curry uh, where a fried soft shell crab was then stewed with peppers and onions and tomatoes cooked down with, I believe, maybe just a dab of coconut broth and some vinegar. Oh, my word. That was absolutely phenomenal. But to your point, Jacqueline, I, uh, I do agree that the soft shell crab is perfect as is. So, hey, thanks for that. I'm going to uh, check on, yeah, I'm just going to let that go. 
So uh, let me show you how to clean the meat in your king crab leg. Oh, and one other soft shell crab, Jacqueline, uh, to your point, if you haven't heard, so up on the coast of Maine and up in New England, we've got an invasive crab, the Asian green crab or the Asian shore crab, and they're wreaking havoc across our ecosystems. Not only do they eat soft shell clams predominantly, uh, thus decimating those populations, an important fishery, especially right here in my hometown of Freeport, uh, but they also burrow into the mud banks and get after the roots of the eel grasses and the shore grasses that, well, when they're gone, cause incredible damage through erosion. And while these crabs are really small, they rarely get bigger than about three inches, uh, they, are, they too go through the molting process and can easily be found throughout the summer season in their soft shell state. And though in America we have no history of a cuisine around these crabs, they make for a great broth, uh, as well as their soft shells. Uh, they're they're a, a delicacy that in Venice is known as molleche, and they're fried, deep fried whole, and they, oh my God, they're so good. So another little soft shell for you, for those of you who on the New England coast. So crab legs, much like all other shellfish, use, the, use leverage. Don't try and fight against these pointy shells. So, Break them by leverage, moving away, you know, working it away from the natural angle that the muscles work in. So at the base, you're going to have the body meat, and that body meat, uh, Carrie, would you mind maybe mm -hmm. focus in on this so I can put it down? Um, so that body meat, this is part of the body, so these are the muscles that control the legs. This is what in blue crab would be your jumbo lump meat right there. Those big giant chunks of meat right there at the back of the animal. Look at that. Man, that's so good. Man, I appreciate friends that send me boxes of crab. That's a delicious thing. So those pieces of meat, so all king crab, well, virtually all of it, uh, snow crab as well is going to come to you cooked. So straight out of the freezer, thaw it out, and it is ready to eat. Uh, and it's also so satisfyingly easy to clean because these big chunks come right off, and the cartilage or any pieces of, of shell around it are very easily visible, so you can see them. Uh, king crab does make for good broth uh, or stock, but I tend not to do so much with it because um, I, well, I can't afford to use that much of it. I don't have it around all the time. But um, it's also been pre-cooked. As I was saying, it comes to you cooked, and it's cooked in a brine solution. Um, so some of that flavor has already sort of been leached out of the shells. So you saw I just used a pair of kitchen shears there. These shells tend to be soft enough that if you can get good purchase on them, you can rip them. Um, but I just sliced straight up, and then, well, out comes that giant, beautiful chunk of meat. Look at that. That's so awesome, right? There you go. So the little dish that I would do with this, um, I've got some diced shallots, I've got some cilantro, and I'll just very roughly chop. And then I'm just gonna slice nice big chunks of this. You wanna use a, a sharp knife to avoid, well, always use a sharp knife to avoid all sorts of bad things. But you don't want to rip that meat apart. So you end up with these really succulent little medallions of it. I'm just going to put that in bowl. Break up these larger chunks from the body. And then I'm going to mix in a little bit of uh, diced shallot. That cilantro. I'm going to go back over here and grab a little bit of olive oil and sherry vinegar. Sherry vinegar being one of my very favorite ingredients. Just a few drops of that because that bold acidity, you really don't need a whole lot of it um, in order to make a big impression. But this is a really nice, easy, uh, subtly flavored way to make like a crab cocktail instead of dousing it with cocktail sauce, which well, is to me, it's a rather American way of cooking. It's like, hey, you know what this gorgeous crab needs? Some ketchup. 
Because, folks, that's really what cocktail sauce is in the end, isn't it? Carrie, would you mind waking up my computer so I can see the questions? And then focusing in on this little mm -hmm. beauty delight while I wash my hands. You want to comment on that and comment below? Well, I'm kind of wondering if you move that over there so I wouldn't be eating it right now. <laughs> you did, didn't you? I did. <laughs> well, you got to keep your camera hands clean. You know? mm -hmm. It's my phone. I got to put it next to my face for the rest of the day. <laughs> when my wife and I were first dating, uh, she had a remarkable and amazing ability good, uh, to call me. Uh, when I was working in restaurants at the time, uh, she could she only called me when I was like elbow deep in a giant pound pile of bluefish, uh, which was our number one seller at the restaurant. But it's the first time I called you. My phone came to smell really bad because I was like, "Oh, she's calling!" and I would pick it up. And... <laughs> anyway, the I things thought, we do for love. Right? I thought you were gonna tell the story of when we got big package of crab legs on our way out the door for Christmas. And it well, was a gift. Yeah, and you, and you were just wondering, like, what have I gotten into? Well, it was the size of a casket. <laughs> and we were so afraid that they would push the freezer door open in our tiny apartment that before we left, we shoved them all in, both of us, all four hands on the freezer, and then duct taped it shut <laughs> behind us. Oh, Yes. We've led a delicious life, haven't we? We were babies. Yeah. Okay, so those are the crabs come out of the broiler there, and this is exactly what I was hoping they would they would become. Sort of the shells get brittle, uh, a little bit smoky and charred, um, and the, the smell that's wafting off of these is incredible. And it's a different taste for crab, that sort of dry heat flavor that you get from a grill, which is how I traditionally do these. But... With these, I just let them get down to about room temperature and serve them with an aioli, especially one made out of like smoked paprika and flavored a little bit of Tabasco in there or Texas peat. Woo. Yeah. All right. So with that, those are all the dishes we're going to demo today. Um, we're going to take some questions. So thanks, you all, for joining me for that part. So from Karina, can you talk about how to clean crab? Yes. Um, so there's – well, it's a big question. Uh, there are – Crabs like the, the king crab, snow crabs, which are very easy to clean because they have long, big chunks of meat that are easily identifiable in the cartilage. As you can see here on one of these legs of king crab, the cartilage is very obvious and pulls out easily. With smaller crabs like blue crabs or box crabs uh, from the Pacific Coast, Dungeness crabs, uh, that yield gets a lot lower and the cartilage is a lot harder to see. Uh, so how to clean crabs, really what you want to do, though, is the, the big parts of it uh, are to remove the top shell, which is called live backing. Um, thank you, Mike. I appreciate your help today. She's off to, the, off to take care of the kiddo again. Um, you want to live back the crab, meaning to pull the carapace off or the shell, to pull the apron off, which is a little flap uh, that is on the bottom side of the crab on the rear. And then you want to remove any viscera and the lungs, which are the little, they look like little pointy fingers, almost like claws, uh, that wrap themselves around the inside of the, of the animal. And once you've removed those, everything left is uh, either cartilage and shell or edible. And at that point, uh, you just kind of need to figure out where those little segments of meat are. Uh, which are fairly identifiable, and then use a small picking fork or something like that to get after them once cooked. So uh, a bit of a broad question and hard to answer uh, without something in hand to visualize. But thank you for your question. We appreciate you. All right, from Abigail, it's time for soft shell questions. What's your favorite prep at home to preserve their unadulterated glory? Well, yes, what a great way to describe them. Um, unadulterated glory. Again, I would say I, a lot of people will call for soaking them in milk uh, and other things. I just, I, I'm at flour, a little bit of Old Bay, and some lemon juice, uh, and the lemon juice at the end. Definitely saute them in butter. I'm a saute on stovetop guy. I don't think they need to be really breaded in a big fluffy, crunchy batter or anything like that, though they are delicious dropped in the deep fryer that way. 
I really just prefer the stovetop. I feel that that contact with heat uh, and just a very thin flour coating held on by the natural juices of the crab is more than enough uh, to kind of protect their flavor and the, and the moisture within, but also that direct contact with heat just adds a, a really great nuance to the flavor and sort of helps it to develop. Uh, but then the other way to uh, I really appreciate their uh, unadulterated glory is to eat a lot of them. Uh, when we find them here, we admittedly eat more than our fair share. Uh, it's one of the very few things that we allow ourselves the overindulgent pleasure of. But um, yeah, wow, they are amazing. Soft shell crabs. So there you go. Butter, lemon juice, a little bit of old band flour. Cheers. Okay, uh, from Sam, what is your favorite way to make soft shell crabs? Wow, okay, so that's the question of the day. So I just answered that for you. Thanks for uh, all of your interest in that. Uh, another one from Star. I would assume a store wouldn't like you to tip the container over to check the product. Uh, you're right on that, but uh, a store is also committed to making sure that you're going home with a product that you like. So maybe ask the person behind the counter to do that for you. Uh, I learned that trick down when I used to shop down on the Main Avenue Seafood Wharf down in Washington, D.C., uh, the nation's longest continuously operating uh, seafood stalls. And down there, everything was just set out on ice on barges floating on the Potomac River. And, well, everything was right in front of you. And down there, it was, uh, it was rather old school. Uh, in the way that they just expected people to be really focused on quality and it was totally okay to do things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, when you're buying the crab, you know, ask them when it came in. Ask them if it was frozen and, and uh, refreshed or thawed. Ask them to tip that over for you to show you the consistency of meat throughout. There, there's absolutely nothing uh, beyond the pale uh, for asking to certify the quality of the product you're about to spend a lot of money on. So. Please uh, don't hesitate to ask them to prove it to you. Cool. All right. How about Jonah crabs from Colleen? Yes, Joan. Um, Colleen, thank you for that. That's a, a category of crab that I did speak about with the uh, the Dungeness crab. Uh, and Dungeness, Jonah, Peaky Toe, and Rock crab, they're all part of the Rock crab family. Dungeness crab being sort of the outlier of that. It has the most sort of contained meat, uh, meaning that the chunks are uh, retain their, their structural integrity, whereas Jonah crab or red rock crab, uh, as are found here in New England, as well as across the Pacific coast, uh, the meat is a little stringier. It falls into small pieces. Uh, and while that's not quite as good for the you know, stunning visual presentation of a lump crab cake like this, yeah, it makes an absolutely delicious crab cake. It has a subtler flavor. Uh, I think it's actually higher on the sweet scale, uh, but lesser on the brine. It doesn't have that texture to it, and so I think it recommends itself to different uses. My favorite amongst them is, is pastas and certainly a risotto. Uh, risottos with Jonah crab are just stunning in the way that it seamlessly integrates into the rice, almost disappearing. Uh, and but just providing this incredible luscious blanket of flavor that coats all of the grains of rice and is, uh, and is just stunning. But you always want to give people a sense of you know a visual sense of what it is they're paying for and eating, and therefore I, I would usually reserve a bit of that crab uh, to serve as like a little salsa on top, you know something very similar to this where I'd take some of that raw or the the cooked crab and just. Toss it with something textured like a diced shallot or a fried leek, uh, and then a little bit of herbs, maybe a tar chopped tarragon, and put a little dollop of that right on top at room temperature or cold so that the warm rice kind of blooms its aroma. Man, you get in some really good eating that way. So, hey, thanks for your question, Colleen. Thanks. It's a really important crab, especially here in New England, to, uh, to raise. So, appreciate you. Appreciate you joining. Okay, from Scott. Our peaky toe crabs from Maine has their flavor compared with those you mentioned. So uh, to Colleen's question as well. So rock crabs, Jonah crabs, peaky toe crabs uh, are all the same. Peaky toe, uh, and a little bit of interesting trivia or history. 
uh, is a name that is based on a colloquialism here in Maine of peaked toe, meaning peaked, curved under uh, in our local language, uh, our local patois, if you will. And a guy named Rod Mitchell, who founded Brown Trading Company here in Portland, Maine, who was a seafood vendor to the star chefs in America, uh, coined that term, peaky toe, dressed it up with this sort of cosmopolitan name and took a heretofore really unused product um, that didn't have any market outside of local New England. Uh, and, well, gave it a name and, and got it all around to chefs all around the world who, who began to appreciate it. So there you go. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. A flat stone in the oven for any reason. Uh, well, yes, Don. It's because that flat stone or pizza stone gets very hot, and I don't ever really think about it after I'm done with the oven. And, well, I just don't want to take it out of the oven when it's hot, but I'm thinking about it. So it just stays in there. But it helps, uh, especially on dishes like I was doing, where the heat of the pan uh, is an important factor. I, I got it smoking hot before I put anything in it. Uh, and the heat of that pan cooking from the bottom helps to caramelize those vegetables, to soften them, to add texture, uh, as well as to help uh, quickly evaporate any moisture that comes off the vegetables or anything above it. Because the last thing you want to do is if you have a cold pan and hot coming down from the broil, what you're going to do is push all moisture down to collect in the pan, at which point it's going to then prevent some of that caramelization, that crisping, uh, and that cooking that you're really looking for. So in that way, a, uh, a stone in there helps to retain that heat on the bottom of the pan, and a good thing. But generally, it's more just, it never really harms anything that I'm trying to cook. It's never really a detriment, so I tend to just leave it in there. Thanks. Appreciate you. And good eyes for noticing that. I appreciate you watching closely. Okay. Uh, another question from Star. I understand about using this, the shell for stocks as it's already been cooked. Uh, could you take the shells and roast them and get a bit more flavor out of them for a taste of stock? Absolutely. So roasting shells uh, just makes some of those flavors more available, uh, but it also does change the flavor. Uh, it gives it a... Uh, it takes away some of the sort of the sea brine aspect to it and gives it a uh, almost an arid flavor. I mean, the shells are literally quite dry after they've been roasted, as these are, um, and concentrates that flavor of a little bit. But then I find that uh, I make all my stocks in a, uh, a steam kettle, not a steam kettle, what are they called? Pressure cooker. Um, and a pressure cooker, just for 20 minutes, Wine, celery, st uh, shells in there it really does make a great, great stock. And you also don't need a huge amount of flavor coming out of that stock in order to effectively augment or bolster the quality of the dish you're making. Whether that's pasta and you're going to boil the pasta in the water, or whether it's a risotto and you're using that stock in addition to wine just as the, the basis of the flavor, you don't need some heavy, rich, redolent liquid in order to achieve this wonderful light uh, sort of perfumed aromatic quality that is really quite beguiling and flattering to a dish. So, hey, thanks, Doc. I really like your questions. You're great. And I really appreciate you joining week after week. So you're wonderful to interact with. Uh, from BKJ, hello, Barton. Thank you for your classes and support. Of course, friend. Nice to be with you. Uh, while stationed in Japan, I've had the distinct pleasure to venture into the waters near Russia and get some giant spider crabs. Ooh, cool stuff, man. Super delicious. Have you ever had them? Absolute best. You know, um, I have not had the giant, I, I don't know exactly the species you're speaking of. I've not had pleasure to, to have what I was sold to me as spider crab. However, there is a deep water red crab here off the coast of Maine uh, that I believe um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, is very similar to what you're speaking of and is sometimes referred to here as spider crab. And these very deep water crabs, as well as another species called uh, golden crab, uh, which is another deep water uh, here that runs from Maine all the way, Labrador, all the way down through the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, 
is, I believe, similar. And they have an incredible sweetness to them. And they have an, an, a lingering aromatic uh, sort of presence on the tongue that is, is truly unique. Um, and, and they don't need any butter, for they are so rich and full of flavor. But uh, hey, so thanks for sharing that with us. I, 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 I look forward to the day when I can have some, some giant spider crab in my kitchen. Uh, or maybe one day, someday, maybe ever get on an airplane again and go explore the delicious seafood up there. Hey, thanks for sharing, Peter. From Kate, I'm confused about the way king crab legs are harvested. Are they pulled off a live crab and they grow back? Someone in Alaska once told me that's what they do. Uh, I, you know, I don't know for certain, Kate, but I'm going to say, uh, Kate, yes, Kate, not Kate. Uh, I'm going to say I don't believe that is the case. Uh, I'm pretty sure that with the large-scale fisheries that the animal is killed uh, and that the legs are pulled off in clusters, uh, as they often are for snow crabs or dungeness, uh, and then the animal is is, is killed. Uh, and other parts of the animal are also used, like those, those leg portions that are coming off the back of the body. There's no way the animal couldn't be harmed greatly with that. However, there is a fishery for crab that does do uh, what uh, the writer Mark Bittman calls the recyclable crab method, which is a stone crab fishery out of Florida, mostly, east coast of Florida. And crabs, uh, like all crustaceans have the ability to regrow appendages. Uh, and so with the snow, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, stone crab fishery, when the male crabs are pulled up, one claw is ripped off and then the animal is thrown back in the water. Uh, and it's assumed, uh, and I think we're beginning to understand maybe a little bit differently, it's just been assumed that the animal then lives, regenerates that claw, and is able to continue to feed and fight with its one claw. Uh, and in that way, kind of consistently produce uh, for our needs. But um, yeah, I don't believe that that's the case with king crab. So hey, thanks for your question and interesting. I'm going to look into that. So cheers. Okay, from Chris E. Is there ever a time to use imitation crab? Well, yeah, Chris. Hey, nice to see you pop up again. Thanks for your email and questions. Um, Chris, this is that dish. Chris had, had sent me a, a question about the toaster oven and which dishes I use. So this is that stall uh, fish pan that I sent you a link to. Um, serves me very well every week, day after day. Uh, but to your point, uh, or to your question, imitation crab, yeah, imitation crab is delicious, man. Uh, I mean, you can laugh at it and say it ain't no good and harken back to the days when it was on the not-so-good salad bar, you know, at the grocery store uh, back in the 80s. Yeah, it, admittedly, not all imitation crab is good. However, there are some really delicious imitation crab out there. Uh, it's made out of pollock, Alaska pollock, uh, a great sustainable fishery out of uh, Alaska, the world's largest single species fishery. And it's a great way to sustainably use parts of the fish outside of the fillet. And this is a, a heavily, well, it's, it's processed and then extruded into uh, the shape very similar to the crab legs and cut into pieces. And you know, Chris, I, I rather like it. I think it's good. Is it is it as delicious as authentic giant red king crab? I, I don't think it really compares, but uh, Pinot Noir and Cabernet are also not the same thing, but they're equally delicious. Um, and I think, especially given the sustainability story behind the util full utilization of the fish and the fact that it really tastes quite good, uh, I mean, it's, it's a product that's very welcome in my kitchen uh, and I've had good fun working with in the past, beyond just the sushi preparations. Something like this, where it's mixed with other flavors like cilantro, lime juice, shallot, uh, a little bit of shaved jalapeno or serrano chili. That's going to eat really well, and I, mean, I can't tell you otherwise. So, yeah, find it, enjoy it, and there's some great brands. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you joining again. Bobby, have you come up with a way to in eat invasive green crabs? So, yeah, just earlier I was talking about uh, how they make really good broth. So, these are crabs, again, that rarely get bigger than about three inches across. Uh, so, 
that means getting any meat out of them is going to be a particularly laborious process, but um, they make a really great broth, uh, can be pounded down and made into a really great bisque. So the way there is just take the whole crab and, and pound it down with a mallet uh, after a simple boil or something, and then simmering that with carrots, rice, celery, onions, and a whole lot of butter, uh, and then making a broth out of it, and then pureeing it in a high-speed blender like a Vitamix, which has always worked really well for me, and then passing it a couple of times through a fine mesh strainer, something really, really actually very fine, something like this. It's really going to capture and uh, you separate out all those bits of shell and anything. And what you're left with after adding a touch of cream is a really fantastic bisque. And the rice is in there at the outset because what that does, that's really the thickener in it. So a green crab bisque is delicious, but also when found as they can be right now, just uh, yesterday, my son and I were down on uh, a little tidal beach here, uh, digging under all the, the rock weed. And once you get under there, you, we were finding hundreds of green crabs, uh, many of them in their soft shell state. And with those, you can just, uh, I just snip off the face, the take off the tablier or the little flap that is the, uh, the organ underneath, and then deep fry them whole. Uh, they're absolutely delicious, little Old Bay lemon juice. And that's a specialty uh, coming to us from Venetian cuisine out of Venice, where in the lagoon there, they celebrate the green crab uh, in their stage as they call moleque, moleche, uh, which is the soft shell state. So, but there's also the, uh, there's, a, there's an entire project around eating green crabs uh, that's based, I don't actually know the, the precise name for it, but uh, the green crab project or something like that, please Google it because there's uh, some really great people putting some awesome effort into creating a market for these invasive and destructive animals. Thanks. Okay, from John. Did you mention that you sold a lot of bluefish at the restaurant? <laughs> I, I figured no one was going to let that one go. Okay. Bluefish can have a strong fishy taste. How do you prepare it, and can you recommend a recipe? Absolutely, John. Well, thanks for catching that. Uh, bluefish, in fact, was my number one seller at the restaurant. Uh, we sold, I mean, at times, we were going through 100 pounds a day of bluefish filet. Now, bluefish is uh, has a is a Jekyll and Hyde kind of identity. It is at once my very favorite fish in the ocean uh, to eat. It is also the very worst fish out of the ocean if it has been out of the ocean too long. Uh, it is a, uh, it goes bad very quickly um, and it tends, to, it has tended to be relegated to it as a lesser fish. So people haven't put a lot of culinary ingenuity into it. Uh, but you know what, John, if I could recommend, please Google the book Blues, B-L-U-E-S, by John, by, uh, um, oh my gosh, John Hersey. Uh, it is the greatest book on food that I have ever read. It is a meditation upon life, on love, on humans' place in nature, on cuisine, on relationships, uh, all told through a narrative of a fisherman and a stranger who just interact over the course of fishing for bluefish. Uh, it, it is a remarkable work of human condition as told through the bluefish. So please pick that up, beautifully written, um, and a work of fiction. Uh, but for bluefish, bluefish when fresh is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it should be scaled. Uh, I like smaller bluefish, typically called snappers, so they just haven't taken on as much. Um, uh, well, smaller bluefish aren't as strongly flavored, uh, but even the big ones are, are certainly great. Uh, but the larger they get, the more effort I would put into removing the bloodline tissue, that dark tissue that laminates the flesh just underneath the skin, uh, which you can do after cooking easily by just lifting the flesh off of that. Uh, but bluefish needs acid, so lemon juice, lime juice, uh, and it needs an aromatic ingredient. And basil, to me, is the Lord's gift to bluefish uh, and humans, uh, just in the way that it, it it's just an essential ingredient to me with bluefish. But within that book, Blues, as I was mentioning, there's an incredible recipe narrated there 
uh, about an old New England technique of grated garlic, grated ginger, soy sauce, a little bit of lime juice, and mayonnaise. Uh, it's mostly mayonnaise flavored with those other ingredients. And then that is slathered on top of the bluefish and then broiled until it is bubbling. It is astounding how good that is. But uh, my other thing about bluefish is that I think it's, there's no such thing as a bad bluefish. There is only once glorious bluefish poorly treated. I'll leave you with that. All right, from Suzanne. Can you post the link to the pan, please? Sure. Um, yeah, maybe Patrick, uh, my colleague at Ruby, uh, could do that. If you look for the Staub 14-inch fish pan, uh, he, he might be able to find that. I see that he also posted a link to greencrab.org uh, for those interested in the green crab recipe. So thanks for that, Patrick. Um, oh, he's already got the John Hersey book up there, too. Patrick, you are, you are excellent at your job and a wonderful colleague to work with. Thank you, buddy. Look at that. Hey, Patrick, can you find me a unicorn? Yeah? Okay. I just thought I'd challenge him there. Okay. Uh, Cynthia, very interesting session. Thank you very much. Can you share the cast iron pan you used to roast the crab dish? Okay. So that is the last link there in the chat thread that Patrick just shared. Why allergic to soft shell, but not hard shell crab? Interesting. So Pamela, I, um, I don't know for sure, but my wife uh, has this issue as well. And, and it um, also is due to new shell or soft shell lobster. And what I believe it is, is that the proteins in the shell are somehow different. The chitin, which is the protein that the shell is made from mostly, I, I think it must be different in some way uh, than it is to the animal when it is uh, when it, the shell is firm. I don't know the science behind that. That is just my supposition. Um, and the reason why I think that is because it happens with lobster for my wife as well as with soft shell crabs. And the difference there is with a soft shell crab, you eat the shell, whereas with a hard shell crab or hard shell lobster or even a soft shell lobster, you don't. But the fact that it happens between soft shell and hard shell lobster as well makes me think that there's something in the shell that is the cause of that. But uh, I've not really been able to find any information on it. I have looked, but it is a curiosity and a fascinating question. And, um, yeah, thanks for asking. I appreciate you joining. Okay, what is the name of that book again from Austin? Uh, Austin, if you look directly above your question, there's an Amazon link to Blues by John Hersey, H-E-R-S-E-Y. Fabulous, fabulous book that uh, really has a fond place in my heart. So, and then the last one from Karina. Uh, how long should I broil fresh crab for? Uh, Karina, which kind of crab are you talking about? If you're talking crab meat, uh, just a few minutes to warm it through. You don't need to cook it. If you're talking about soft shells, uh, soft shell crabs, you'd want to broil it until really the, the external, is, the, the exterior is the texture that you want. Um, and that if cut through, the meat and the innards are set. Um, uh, and if you're talking about these uh, crab legs here, broiled or on the grill, really, I have them in for about 15 minutes uh, in a toaster oven broiler. I think you probably could get that down to eight minutes or so in a, in a bigger, higher heat broiler. But if you're on the grill, really directly over the high heat area, I would say no more than five to seven minutes uh, turning them once. You don't want to incinerate the shells, but you do want to get them just charred enough, like as you're seeing here, so that they impart that flavor and that you can be sure that the heat has penetrated the hard shell and warmed the meat through. All right. So with an old Patrick, you found a unicorn. Thanks, buddy. Okay. So everyone, thanks again so very much for joining and for sticking around and for so much interaction. We love you, we stand with you, and we think you're delicious and uh, hope you enjoy these. Please join us every Thursday 
uh, for these. I think next week we're up with uh, continuing for Shellfish Month with clams and mussels, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, please do check out my own books. I always appreciate the support. Uh, there's a link right there to them, American Seafood, Joy of Seafood in particular, I think are relevant to this. Uh, but also, again, as I started off with, though we are back to regularly scheduled programming, we are coming to you today and joining you with the acknowledgement that, um, well, life, regular life for way too many of us is, is not what it should be, and that we stand in solidarity with all those in our community, Black Lives Matter, and we love you, we support you, and we are listening. Even though we are broadcasting, we are still listening to you, and we love you. So with that, stay delicious, everyone. Please join us again. Thanks.